Queen Elizabeth II has canceled Prince Andrew's birthday party in the wake of the prince's BBC interview about his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. In a statement from Buckingham Palace, the queen said she had been planning a a delightful affair with balloons and a clown and even possibly some ice cream cake. But since the prince insisted on raping little girls, he did not deserve any balloons and instead would have to eat his ice cream cake in a room by himself, although she might still allow the clown to entertain the family privately. In his interview with the BBC, Prince Andrew insisted that the pictures of him surrounded by bare-breasted underage girls on Epstein's private pedophile island were clearly faked since his honorable but traumatizing service during the Falklands Islands, Falkland Islands War had left him unable to pronounce the word breast, thus rendering him incapable of instructing the girls to expose themselves. Prince Andrew further told the BBC interviewer that his service had left him unable to sweat and that that water pouring down his face during the interview was some sort of miracle, which was further proof of his innocence because God would not have done that for him if he'd been guilty of raping little girls, since God has generally agreed to frown on such behavior. After the Queen announced she would be canceling his birthday party, Prince Andrew said he was devastated to learn Mummy was cross with him and hoped that perhaps she would change her royal mind and let him have the balloons because he so loves balloons and hadn't meant to give such a naughty interview. And after all, the girls he had been with weren't really children or they wouldn't have had those terrific breasts. The Queen later released a statement saying there might be one or two balloons if the prince was very good, but she would see. However, if Prince Andrew ever raped a child again, he would be sent to his room, which is the county of Sussex. Trigger warning. I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky dunky, life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo. Ship shaped, dipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. Oh, hooray, hurrah. So lately, I've received a number of letters complaining that I've been unfair to the alt-right. Almost all of these letters say that I haven't taken the grievances of the Groypers seriously enough. That is, I don't see where they're coming from. For instance, when the left decries whiteness as a toxic character trait and then celebrates the fact that white people will soon be a minority in a nation that hates them, shouldn't it be easy to see why white folks would find that threatening? After years of endless foreign wars that seem to help Israel more than America, isn't it obvious why some people might become suspicious of the large number of Jews among hawkish neoconservatives? Now, it's unfair to say that I haven't taken at least some of these complaints seriously. The left's anti-white racism is disgusting, and I've denounced it repeatedly. All racism, from New York Times identity politics to Ku Klux Klan identity politics, seems morally exactly the same to me. Not just a sin against the image of God, but a stupid idea that makes you stupider the further you follow it. As for Jews, there's no doubt they're a very successful minority, which means both their good guys and their bad guys will be influential. They have a right to fight for what they want, like all of us, and I see absolutely no reason why we can't agree and disagree with their arguments on the merits instead of penalizing them for the fact that they have thrived in America as a group. Good for them. All of which is simply to point out that just because the left is wrong doesn't mean the alt-right is right. In fact, it seems to me they're making the exact same mistake the left always makes. The alt-right is adopting the very values they oppose. If the left is wrong to be racist against white, whites, then it must be equally wrong to be racist against people of other colors. Likewise, if it would be wrong for American Jews to support Israel simply because they're Jews, it would be equally wrong to condemn Israel and their supporters simply because they're Jews. The left is wrong, I say so all the time, so is the alt-right, and for exactly the same reasons. Our old friend St. Paul had some good advice in these matters. Namely, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Politics isn't beanbag, and sometimes you have to play rough, and when it comes to choosing between devils and jerks, you have to side with the jerks every time. But the conservative movement is in the midst of a massive and much-needed realignment, and if we let that realignment become poisoned with race or religious hatred, then it can only lead to one of two terrible outcomes. Their haters will win, or our haters will win, and in either case, the worst people will take over the country. There's got to be a better way than that. And we'll be talking about ideas and how they poison the well, how they poison the well of the American conversation just a second. But first, we'll be talking about something much jollier than than that, namely Ventura watches. I am wearing what has now become, I think, my favorite watch, which is a Ventura watch. It is really uh, attractive, very nice. The band is nice. The face is nice, really easy to read. And guess what? 
They're in the midst of a massive holiday sale. Everything on the Vincero site is on sale. There are no exclusions. Products do sell out, so don't wait to buy. Head over to VinceroWatches.com slash Clavin to see my favorite picks and take advantage of their biggest sale of the year. Vincero has watches for every style and price point. You're sure to find one that suits you. You can engrave any message on them you choose, your favorite quote, your name, anniversary date. It's the best possible gift because it's tailored with a personal touch. This deal is is too good to pass up, go to V-I-N-C-E-R-O watches.com forward slash Clavin and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. Vincero is making it so easy for you to shop with a huge discount. Go to my link by a Vincero. It's time. <laughs> Pun intended. V-I-N-C-E-R-O watches.com forward slash Clavin. And how do you spell Clavin? V-A-N, there are no e. There are no e. I knew you were going to say that. Mailbag is tomorrow. The mailbag is tomorrow. This is your last chance before Thanksgiving to actually have something to be thankful for. You've got of, mail. Instead of your annoying relatives, go to dailywire.com. Hit the podcast button. Hit the Andrew Claven podcast. Hit that mailbag symbol, and you can ask any question you want. <laughs> And you can then yeah. scream like that while you're asking the questions. You'll certainly scream like that with glee and joy after you get your answers. You have to be a subscriber. It's a lousy 10 bucks a month, lousy 100 bucks for the year. For the 100 bucks, you also get this Leftist Tears tumbler, hand carved out of ivory and gold, and uh, then shaped on the thighs of Los Angeles virgins. Uh, no one's ever seen a Los Angeles virgin, but I'm sure they're out there because we have the tumblers to prove it. Ask any question you want. Ask about religious religion, politics, your personal life, all my answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life, possibly for the better. You know, it's easy to see why leftist ideas drive right-wingers insane. It's easy to see why right-wingers feel justified in saying all kinds of crazy stuff just to fight back. It's, it's like unbelievable the things that they talk about and the bias in their news that they think is absolutely objective. Brian Stelter, or as Sean Hannity calls him, Humpty, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's a pretty good one. Brian Stelter has a cult expert on his show. Listen to this. What is this guy's name? He is cult expert uh, Stephen Hassan. And he talks about the fact that anyone who voted for Trump is a member of an evil cult. I am referring to uh, the, uh, Trump's organization and, and mm. followership as a destructive cult where people are being fed propaganda and they're not being encouraged to think for themselves. They're not being encouraged to really explore and, and look at the details and arrive at their own conclusion. Much of what they're hearing is emotionally driven, uh, loaded words, thought st stopping and, and thought terminating type cliches like fake news or build the wall or make America great again. You say the president is using mind control, but how, how is that provable? So we can start with the pathological lying, which is characteristic of destructive cult leaders, saying things in a very confident way that have nothing to do with facts or truthfulness, the, the blaming others and never taking responsibility for his own failures and faults, uh, shunning and, and kicking out anyone who raises questions or concerns about his own behavior. His use of, of fear mongering, uh, immigration is, is a horrible thing. It is frightening to hear a cult expert say that you see all these signs right now, today, in American politics. <laughs> it is, it's incredibly frightening. I don't believe this guy. It's incredibly frightening. So here we have the signs of an evil cult, uh, uh, propaganda. Uh, people are not being encouraged to think for themselves. They're not being encouraged to really explore. This is a quote to explore and look at the details and arrive at their own conclusions. They use emotionally driven, loaded words and cliche. So we sent out our crack Daily Wire team of undercover uh, investigators to see if we could find some examples of this. So the emotionally driven, loaded words, the cliches uh, being fed propaganda. And we actually came up with a video of this in taking place. After yesterday's explosive testimony. Kicking off what promises to be another explosive week in the impeachment inquiry. Uh, we're bracing for potentially an explosive 
opening statement. Those are some of the fireworks from today's explosive testimony. Another explosive day of testimony. High stakes heading into a potentially explosive week of testimony. The most explosive thing. This is a slow motion explosion. Major breaking news are right now. The explosive, truly explosive opening remarks. I, I can't emphasize how explosive this is. How explosive. Very explosive. <laughs> that is shocking. A cult taking place right in front of our very uh, eyes. These cultic, uh, you know, repeated words with emotional, uh, you know, char- emotionally charged words, the cliches. It is he's the guy is right. We are running a cult. You know, <laughs> I mean, it is comical that they can't see themselves. So it drives the, the right crazy. It drives the right crazy. This is the news. You turn on the news, CNN, the most trusted name in news. Ha ha ha. But and that's what you see on the news. And it drives you crazy. And and. And it goes far, far beyond that because, you know, go go on and just Google the word gender, a word that two minutes ago had a very simple meaning. We understood what it meant. Here's I just Googled this and here's a video I came up with. It's put out by PBS. So this is public funded stuff. I think the name of the show is The Origins of Things or something. Listen to this carefully and see if you can pick out the fallacies, but I, I will point them out. But this is important stuff. This is stuff that makes it into our schools and children are taught this uh, kind of thing. So listen to this for a minute. There are people who are intersex, meaning that they share a variety of these traits across the sexual divide. People can have XX chromosomes associated with women, but present in most other ways as male and vice versa. It's also possible to have a mixture of these traits that aren't easily quantifiable and don't align neatly with male or female designations. Although in some of these cases, there are parents and healthcare providers who choose an assigned sex for a child born with a mixture of traits at birth. But while sex is mostly considered biological, Gender is its more loosely defined cousin. Gender relates to the performance of roles, identities, and ideas surrounding masculine, feminine, or neutral traits. And more often than not, we link gender to both outward behaviors and internal ideas about ourselves. A good example of performing gender in society would be a statement like, all girls' favorite color is pink. The first assumption is that girl lines up with female sex, and the second is that given the choice, most if not all girls will not only choose pink as their favorite color, but will also be naturally predisposed to liking pink over other colors. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. (laughs) So we added that last part in, but but the thing is, this this is incredibly poisonous stuff, to, especially to teach it to children. But look at the f- fantasies. She starts out talking about <clears throat> the fact that there are people who are uh, the fallacies. She starts out talking about the fact that there are people who are intersex. Absolutely true. There are people who have that problem. But there are also people who have one leg. And if I said to you, human beings have two legs, you would understand that to be the case. That would be, in fact, if I said it, human beings are a human being is a featherless biped. That would be true whether or not there were a vanishingly small number of people born with feathers or born with one leg or born with three legs. It would still be true that the human animal is a featherless biped. It is the same thing that when you have that you do have people who are intersex, it, you have all kinds of things that go wrong in the reproduction of human beings. But it is still true to say that people come in two sizes, male and female. Those are the two kinds of human beings there are. There ain't any more. Those are the two kinds. The other thing is this kind of typical feminist argument uh, where she puts forward this all all girls like pink. No one would ever say that. I mean, that, that is a non exist That's there is there is a zero number. Zero percent of people would make that statement that girls tend to favor pink uh, more than guys do is, in fact, the case. And, and, you know, you see that. And does that become sort of coded into society? <clears throat> yes, but it's a human universal. I mean, she points out in this video, she says there are places where they uh, recognize a third sex. That's true, too. That, you know, that is true. There are uh, um, primitive societies where they recognize a category of person, again, vanishingly small that is a third sex, but we recognize that here too. But the very fact that they are a third sex tells you that really there are only two and then there are these variations. Nobody says there aren't variations among people. Nobody says there aren't masculine women and feminine men. That, you know, that's ridiculous. The fact that they're using that to, to, to take apart what is a human universal, which is the divide between male and female on which all societies, every single one is based, that that is the the fallacy. So how does this happen? There is a terrific article uh, in the Wall Street Journal the other day by a guy named Peter Bogosian, an author, 
And he talks about how the academies are feeding these terrible and destructive ideas and stupid ideas into our culture. And this is the thing that I believe is driving the right a little bit insane as we ourselves start to see that our our former conservative consensus has collapsed and we're trying to build it back again. And we've got people like the Never Trumpers saying, no, 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 it's all, we should just stick to what we had. It was good. We're still living in the Reagan era. And obviously most of us know that's not true, but we don't know how we're going to move on into a new world. So let me just read you this article in just a second. But first, let me talk about Zovio. You know, my wife is always teasing me that I'm the only person in our family who doesn't have a higher uh, degree. I only have a BA, BA degree, I guess a bachelor's degree. And she says, she teases me because I don't have a higher degree. And I always say to her, that's because I paid for everybody else to get the higher degrees. But it is true that a master's degree, a higher degree can help you get ahead. And you don't want to wind up like me working in a hellhole like this, right? So you want better jobs. You want more advancement. A master's degree can help you to be a whole new you. And you can get this through Ashford University. It's convenient and flexible. Ashford University's online master's degree program allows you to learn at your own pace. You can study wherever you're the most comfortable learning. You can take one course at a time. Ashford University's six-week-long courses allow you to take one course at a a time. Uh, It's easy enrollment. The GRE, GMAT, and other standardized test scores are not required for enrolling at Ashford University. It's a fully accredited uh, school. New opportunities are right around the corner. Now's the time to start earning your master's degree. Enroll now by going to ashford.edu slash Andrew. That's ashford.edu slash Andrew to start your master's degree today. Ashford.edu slash Andrew. And then when you have a master's, you too will be able to make fun of me like my wife does. Uh, So... And our, here's this article about what he calls, what Peter Bogosian calls laundering ideas. He says, you've almost certainly heard some of the following terms, cisgender, fat shaming, heteronormativity, intersectionality, patriarchy, rape culture, and whiteness. And the reason you've heard them is that politically engaged academic academicians have been developing concepts like these for more than 30 years, and all that time they've been percolating. Only recently have they begun to emerge in mainstream cultures. These academicians, is that what you Academicians, yes. Uh, people in the academy, they accomplish this by passing off their ideas of knowledge. That is, as if these terms describe facts about the world and social reality. And when some, while some of these ideas may contain bits of truth, they aren't scientific. By and large, they're the musings of ideologue. So how does this happen? How do they do this? All right. Here's how it works. It's called it's called idea laundering. And that was a phrase made by Brett Weinstein, who, if you've seen the movie No Safe Spaces, was hounded uh, out of Evergreen State College in a truly vicious, uh, uh, truly vicious riots and fear mongering and threats. And he calls this idea laundering like money laundering. Here's how it works. First, various academics have strong moral impulses about something. For some, for example, they perceive negative attitudes about obesity in society, and they want to stop people from making the obese feel bad about their condition. In other words, they convince themselves that the clinical concept of obesity, which is a medical term, is merely a story we tell ourselves about fat, a descriptive term, okay? Second, the academics who share these sentiments start a peer-reviewed periodical, such as Fat Studies, which is an actual academic journal. They organize fat studies like every other academic journal with a board of directors, a codified submission process, special editions with guest editors, a pool of credentialed experts to vet submissions, and so on. The journal's founders, allies, and collaborators then publish articles in fat studies and grow their journals, right? Eventually, after activist scholars petition university libraries to carry the journal, making it financially viable for a large publisher like Taylor and Francis, Fat studies becomes established. They then have an answer when one asks the obvious question, how could fat be just a narrative? There's overwhelming medical evidence reliably indicating that excessive fat is a health hazard. So it has nothing to do with stories we tell. It's a health hazard, right? In response, the grievance scholars point to articles in the peer-reviewed journal fat studies and say, look, there are peer-reviewed articles. But again, the whole thing is a scam, right? Because they set up the journal to work this way. And it doesn't stop there. Grievance scholars then use articles like these published in fat studies to credential themselves and receive promotion and tenure. And that's why you've heard of some of these terms, which are not factual. They don't uh, don't relate to anything 
except the imagination of these scholars. It's like the word dragon, right? You can say dragon all you want. You can draw a picture of a dragon, but there ain't no such thing as dragon. And that is the same with cisgender, with fat shaming, with heteronormativity. These are things that just exist in the minds of these professors by setting up these journals and then pointing to them as if they were facts. They make them infest the culture at large and politics at large. So this does two things, right? For one, th for the one thing, it, it drives the right crazy, like I said, and it gives some kind of credence to people on the right who are saying bad things, things that are not true, but they can point at the left and say, well, you know, we're reacting to this thing and everybody says, well, now it makes sense in context, but it really doesn't. But just as importantly, it means that the left is now living in a fantasy world. And this is what happens when they bring their ideas out recently. Michael Bloomberg has just announced that he's going to join the race, the Democrat race for president, right? Elizabeth Warren just blew herself up by announcing the details of her health care plan. And everybody looked at it and said, oh, good, a 50 quadrillion gazillion dollar plan. Uh, and she's going to finance it by taking two cents away from each of 600 billionaires. I mean, it was just nonsense. It was a complete fantasy. Look life. at her cheekbones. <laughs> yes. And look at her cheekbones, right? The New York Times, a former newspaper, and now basically the Trump crazy, uh, the Trump derangement syndrome center of the Democrat Party, are, are themselves writing, wrote an article today, Democrats increasingly vocal in calling Medicare for all a political liability. Party leaders are describing the health care proposal that appeals to the party's left as a risky bet that could neutralize one of the Democrats' prime issues in 2020. As long as these ideas are talked about generally, as long as they're used emotionally, cisgender, fat shaming, Medicare for all, they're fine. The minute you bring out the details and they hit the air, everybody goes like, uh -oh, that's a bad idea. You know, let's not do that. So prominent Democratic leaders reading from the New York Times, a former newspaper, prominent Democratic leaders are sounding increasingly vocal alarms to try to halt political momentum for Medicare for all, opting to risk alienating liberals and deepening the divide in the party rather than enter an election year with a sweeping health care proposal that many see as a liability for candidates up and down the ballot. So why is Michael Bloomberg, who announced before that he was not going to enter the race, why is he entering the race now? I think the, re the answer is obvious. There is a hole where the moderate candidate should be. These left-wingers talk to themselves. They are infested with these academic ideas that are stupid. Young people buy into them because they've been taught these ideas in school as if they were knowledge, as if they were facts, when they really are manufactured fantasies that, are, that get these peer-reviewed approval from the people who manufactured the fantasies um, in the first place. So it's, it's really as if I started a peer-reviewed magazine on studying dragons, on the existence of dragons. It's exactly like this when they're talking about cisnormal heteronormativity and all this stuff. Exactly the same as I start a magazine and all the crazy people, all the fantasists who believe in dragons get together and we have peer-reviewed studies and then we get this into the library and then we get a publisher to do it. And then when people say, but, 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 <clears throat> there are no dragons, we say, you anti-dragon bigot, here are the peer, here are scholars in a peer-reviewed magazine who say there are dragons, all right? So there was a place for a normal candidate, a moderate candidate, and that candidate was Joe Biden. The problem is Biden has no spine, he has no principles, he sells out, and he started to sound like a leftist himself. And then on top of that, he's 112 years old, he is falling apart, he is decaying as we watch, and then third, he's corrupt. So finally, Bloomberg, who said he's not going to get into it, says that he, he now is the man who can beat Donald Trump. Here he is making his announcement. If President Trump wins another term in office, we may never recover from the damage that he can do. The stakes could not be higher. We must win this election. And we must begin rebuilding America by investing here at home and restoring our nation's credibility and moral leadership abroad. I believe my unique set of experiences in business, government, and philanthropy will enable me to both win and to lead. As a candidate, I'll rally a broad and diverse coalition to win. And as president, I'll have the skills to fix what is broken in our great nation. And there is a lot broken. We have an economy that is tilted against most Americans. 
We have a health care system that costs too much and doesn't cover everyone. We have communities ravaged by gun violence, including here in this region. Sadly, mass shootings, like the one earlier this year, just 17 miles from here in Virginia Beach, have become almost routine. We cannot accept that. We have to put an end to this madness. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. <laughs> you should have put that on there. Uh, what's really interesting about this, he's, he can beat Trump, but what's really interesting is what his campaign manager, uh, Kevin Sheakey, said uh, on CNN. Listen to this. Mike is getting in this race because he thinks that Donald Trump is an existential crisis, and he thinks he's on a path to victory. And he's getting in to, to alter that uh, dynamic. We're going to run a campaign against the president. We're going to run a campaign to try to, Mike, to make Mike the Democratic nominee. We're going to try to bring those together. But both of those things are happening right now. So obviously, comment. Also, obviously, he'll talk about in Virginia uh, the elections that occurred there recently. He had a big hand in it. Mike, you know, listen, really led uh, a campaign to elect Democrats to the House of Delegates down there. It's the first time in a very long time where the Democrats hold both houses and the governorship. Uh, it's been a big fight for us a real, for a very long time because of the issue of guns and all the illegal guns that come out of the state of Virginia and flow to the rest of the country and also the issue of the environment. So you, the, the key thing there was he said, Mike thinks that Trump is on the path to victory. And of course, I think he is too. And the reason he's on a path to victory is because, A, the Democrats do nothing in the Congress. They do absolutely nothing. The impeachment thing is blown up in their faces, no matter what the press tells you. And, and, the, uh, and all the candidates are on the left. Again, no matter what the press tells you. <clears throat> Pete Buttigieg can sit, call himself a moderate all he wants, but he's not. In fact, MS, and, and the left is angry about this. The left is angry about Bloomberg entering the race. MSNBC, the, one of the voices of the left, aside from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all the networks, but one of the open voices for the left, uh, put together a montage of the left-wing candidates shocked and dismayed to have this guy enter the race. So five. Yeah. We do not believe that billionaires have the right to buy elections. That is why multi-billionaires like Mr. Bloomberg are not going to get very far in this election. Elections should not be for sale. Not to billionaires, not to corporate executives. We need to build a grassroots movement. That's how democracy is supposed to work. Money will not win this election. Connecting with people will. You know, listen. Uh, we got to get money out of politics. I, let me just be honest with you. I mean, um, I got to raise a ton of money to be competitive. And, you know, there's some people who started this race with $10 million. Are you drunk? <laughs> she, she's not even talking sense. I mean, that is not talking talk, getting money out of politics. What does that even mean? How, I mean, how do you get money out of politics? What do you just kind of have rainbows, you know, like sparkling ideas floating around in the air? Utterly ridiculous. They all concentrate on his wealth. But, of course... What they're saying is uh, a paradox because if he can't buy it, then his wealth doesn't matter. And uh, Hillary Clinton couldn't buy it from Trump. <clears throat> Trump spent, I think, about half as much as she did and won the election. However, Bloomberg has he has dumped a he dumped an ad buy. <clears throat> He's avoiding the first primaries. He's going into the later primaries, a strategy which never works. He's going national with his ad buy. His ad buy is huge. I think it's a record breaking like 30 million dollar uh, ad buy. He's got big problems. First of all, he's got a massive news organization, Bloomberg News, and they announced that they are, since they're not going to investigate him, they're not going to investigate any of the other Democrat candidates, but they will continue to investigate Donald Trump. So what makes them different from the New York Times? I mean, what makes them different from all the other press? They've just become typical of all the other press. So that is that is truly compromising to his news organization. If the Bloomberg News organization actually makes an open uh, statement that they are not going to um, that they're not going to investigate um, any of the other Democrats, but they will investigate Trump. They've just become uh, completely useless like CNN. So as many people will be watching them as CNN. The second problem is Bloomberg himself, when he said that he wasn't going to run, he said at some point, you got to say, look, I would be 79 years old when I took office. People say, well, Ronald Reagan was 80 when he left. Yeah, when he was 80, they carried him out gaga, he says. To start a four-year job, maybe an eight-year job at age 79 may not be the smartest thing to do. Uh, but I think if I thought I could, I would have entered the race. So he, the, he himself says he shouldn't be in it. 
he also said, I, I, he, I would have to change all my views and go on what CNN called an apology tour. And he's already started that. He apologized for New York's policy of stop and frisk, which was a badly named policy. It was a policy where the police spotted you and thought you were carrying a gun. They could uh, come after you. And the New York Times and the left helped bring that policy down, which was saving black lives. It was an absolute shame that they brought it down. Um, and his third problem is he's a big nanny state guy, which is really unappealing. And Trump will bounce him down the street. I mean, he's only a little fellow. He's only like five feet tall. So Trump towers over him and he'll bounce him down the street with the policies that he put in. He tried to ban uh, uh, sodas, big sodas in New York. He actually did ban uh, having more than uh, two to one ratio of female and male restrooms. Uh, he basically he put in place a two term limit for city elected officials and then violated it. Uh, he's, his record is, is not that good. And the very fact that he's in the race tells us that the bad ideas are blowing back on the left. We shouldn't come up with our own bad ideas to battle them. We should come up with good ideas to battle them, which would be the way to go. Paint your life. You know, I, unfortunately, I put my paint your life picture of myself across the room and I cannot reach it. Next time their sponsors come on, I will show you. It is absolutely great. Uh, it is a portrait of me taken from a photograph. <clears throat> now, obviously, your portrait of you won't be as beautiful as a portrait of me because you're not me, but it is amazing. It is an amazing thing that they do. Uh, it's a hand-painted, it's an original painting of yourself or your children or your family, whatever you want, uh, from paintyourlife.com. It is a real painting. It is done by hand by a real painter, a world-class artist, and it's created from a favorite favorite photo and they just turned it into a portrait. It is really, it really is nice. And I'm sorry, I can't show it to you, but take my word for it. It looks like me. So it's absolutely beautiful. There's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded. It is wonderful to hang up, to decorate your house or to give as a gift. Right now, as a limited time offer, you can get 30% off your painting. That's right. 30% off and free shipping. To get this special offer, text Andrew to 64 Zero, zero, zero. That's 64,000. Text Andrew to 64,000. Of course, it's A-N-D-R-E-W to 64,000 for a really terrific painting of your kids or yourself. Just so you know, the Clavenless weekend is going to be long, right? Because Thanksgiving is coming. I mean, this is it. Thanks, you know, Thanksgiving is coming. It is a Clavenless Thanksgiving. Uh, the wailing, the gnashing of teeth, it's really going to be terrible. Wednesday will be our final show of the week. But check my show feed on Black Friday, and we're going to announce some really exciting news and great deals that we are giving away. We are part of Black Friday. You're not going to want to miss it. It will be something to cling to in the Clavenless weekend uh, before your utter destruction. All right. The mailbag is tomorrow. Go to dailywire.com. Subscribe. Hit the podcast button. Hit the Andrew Claven podcast. Hit that uh, that mailbag symbol and ask me what you want. All your problems will be solved. We have David Limbaugh coming up. We're going to continue this conversation about bad ideas because he's got a new book on exactly that subject. David Limbaugh, you know, is a lawyer, nationally syndicated columnist with Creator Syndicate. He's a political commentator and author of nine national bestsellers. His newest one is Guilty by Reason of Insanity, Why the Democrats Must Not Win. It's out now. David, you there? I'm here. Thank you. Hey, would you send me one of those uh, a prints of your portrait for Christmas? I mean, I... <laughs> you need a, a dartboard? Is that what? The... <laughs> <laughs> so explain this title, Guilty by Reason of Insanity. Who are we talking about? Well, it's actually a euphemism. Uh, the the uh, insanity really should, is a substitute for evil. But I'm, I'm kidding. No, the, uh, <laughs> the, the purpose of the book, I mean, the, the subtitle says it all, Why Democrats not, not, Must Not Win. The, the Democratic Party has become so far left. Uh, you could say they're a wholly owned subsidiary of the far left, but another good argument is that they're a wholly owned subsidiary of the far left media. Mm. It's probably the same thing. The media is kind of dancing them around like a puppet these days and got them out on their ski, over their skis on impeachment. But the, the purpose of this book is to highlight all the many issues on which the Democrats have gone nuts and how extreme they are, how indefensible their positions are, and how the, if they regain power in the political branches, executive and legislative, I think they will complete Obama's fundamental transformation of America into a land 
that our framers would not even recognize. So, you know, I've been reading your, I've been keeping up with your work and your books have been terrific, but they've recently, most of your books have been about Christianity, if, unless I'm wrong. All the ones I can remember have been about Christianity. How come you suddenly came back to the political arena? Yeah, I went, I did five political books, then I did four Christian themed books and my publisher, Regnery, asked me if I would go back to politics huh. because we face such an existential crisis uh, in terms of, uh, the 2020 election, and I agree, it's, it's an urgent situation, so I wanted to get back to it on this book. So you, the ideas that you go through, you start with uh, ideas about race. How, how do their ideas about race qualify as insane? Well, uh, there's uh, several things. One is, they're, they're, this isn't insane, but it's despicable, that they practice identity politics almost exclusively now. They don't even have to defend their policy positions, all of which are failures. Uh, and so they just demonize us on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation, class, and everything else. But a big feature of that, of course, is race. And, and they have pitted uh, blacks against whites, uh, b whites against all minorities, gend us up to, to make people think that conservatives hate them. So they don't have to prove that socialism is a legitimate idea. All they've got to do is convince people that even if capitalism might have some merit, the people who promote it are racist and they hate you. Therefore, you can't vote for them. By the way, we're making inroads. Trump is making inroads into the, into the black community. So it's not working as well as it used to, uh, which is an interesting thing. But uh, the, the ra they are also rejecting Martin Luther King's legacy, which is to judge people on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. This seems tried, it's so obvious, but they're advocating color consciousness, and almost uh, segregation now. They're, they're, they're completely looking at people's external qualities instead of what's in their heart and, what, and their behavior and conduct. What do you think the actual impact of that on minorities and women has been? Oh, t terribly destructive. I mean, the, the black community, in, in generalized terms, is voting against its own economic interests. We've seen the incredible record on unemployment and, and wages and prosperity and uh, standard of living in the black community. And, but we, we also have to understand that these, these liberal progressive policies have had the effect of breaking up the nuclear family. And, and it's had a devastating impact on blacks with fathers not in the homes. And you see all the statistical detrimental results from that. But uh, so many black families are, do subscribe to conservative traditional values. And so there's a natural clash that's erupting here. And we just have to tap into it. We're talking to David Limbaugh. His new book is Guilty by Reason of Insanity. This, this is a question that comes into my mind all the time. It, the, some of the stuff that the left is embracing it, is just completely uh, out there. It's completely illogical, illegal immigration, uh, it, not just abortion, but actual infanticide, uh, some anti-Semitism definitely creeping in there. What do you think they're hoping to get out of that? Why would they embrace those things, which we have to imagine are not that popular uh, with the mainstream public? I don't know that, that it's a matter of pragmatism. They are so extreme. They're so intoxicated with their extremism. And they do live in a bubble, and they they assume they're more popular than they are. If you see Hollywood, and you know Hollywood, yeah. uh, the the uh, the dominant culture, uh, the the media, you see their their ideas everywhere. They're they they force them down our throats. And if you were to believe the picture they paint of America, the cultural America, there is no such thing as flyover country except except uh, Trump supporting hayseeds. Uh, and alt-right white nationalists, which is a completely different picture than reality. So I, I think they're promoting these ideas, and let's, let's highlight what these ideas are. To, to Not just abortion, they, they used to say abortion was something we ought to make safe, legal, and rare, and I never believed their sincerity, because if, if it's a, the, the unborn is a clump of cells, there's no reason to make it rare. So right there, you knew they were lying, but they wanted to do it anyway in furtherance of the woman's right. Now, they admit because of technology. Many of them admit it's a life and want to kill it anyway. And not only want to kill the baby all the way up to the point of birth and beyond, but celebrate and glorify it through their Shout Your Abortion t-shirts, through lighting up pink uh, New York Towers pink, from a leftist professor going on a college campus and actually speaking to a class about the affirmative moral morality of abortion. Yeah, no. And, and then this isn't insane, it's pure evil. In fact, no, no, it is pure evil. It's pure evil. That's unarguable.
So I, 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 I'm just about out of time, but quickly, the question I get asked all the time is, how do you fight back? What do you, what do you, what do you think is the best path forward for conservatives? Well, I think what you are doing, what I'm doing, what Rush and Sean are doing, what Ben Shapiro is doing, what Michael Knowles is doing, little plug for Daily Wire there, <laughs> uh, I, and this book, in my little way, not being the grandiose celebrity star that you guys are, <laughs> I try to compile all these issues, not just anecdotes and examples, but the philosophical underpinnings for some of their crazy ideas and present in a lay to, to, the, to layman uh, the arguments in favor of our issues, why defending capitalism, indicting socialism, explaining why open borders is suicidal and immoral, not just intellectually crazy, but immoral. We need to take the left on. They've always had the moral high ground saying they're compassionate. Judge them by the results of their policies instead of their professed good intentions. And this book attempts to go issue by issue and, and provide ammunition for geniuses like you who can go out then and, and proselytize in a secular sense. I love it. David Limbaugh, author of Guilty by Reason of Insanity, Why the Democrats Must Not Win. It's always great talking to you, David. Thanks for coming you on. You too. Liberals at the door. Some <laughs> left at the door. <laughs> Thanks Thank a lot. You. Um, final reflection, uh, you know, we started out talking about the bad ideas on the right as reactions, uh, to the left. And that, that means that, you know, that, and the thing is they have things that they want to say the alt-right and I feel like they're saying them in the wrong way. Recently, I started to get attacked everywhere I went by people calling me names. This didn't happen to me for a long time because I'm basically as pretty hard to tag me with racist, uh, you, accusing me of racism, accusing me of, uh, you can accuse me of sexism, but it is a benign uh, form of sexism. I recognize and celebrate the sexes. It was just a little hard for them to get me. They settled on Islamofascism. But I noticed recently when I was at Boston College and they behaved so shamefully and they behaved with a, almost a riot uh, as I was speaking, the uh, very left-wing and biased uh, newspaper, the school newspaper, which didn't call me, didn't asked me for a quote uh, in in uh, response to their charges of me being Islamofascism, found a quote from my memoir, The Great Good Thing, which really surprised me that they had even gone that far. And here's the quote that they used that, to attack me. It sometimes seems to me the entire postmodern assault on the concept of truth has been staged to avoid the conclusion that some cultures are simply more productive than others, and the high culture of Europe has been the most productive so far. It is as if, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, Western thinkers have become so skittish around the idea of racism, they will do anything to avoid naming their culture as superior to others, even if it means avoiding the evidence of their own eyes. This is supposed to be racist. It's supposed to be a terrible idea to say that the culture of uh, the high culture of Europe is superior to any, in my opinion, to any culture that has existed uh, heretofore. And I assume the reason for this is that the people of Europe can be delineated as white. So it's the same exact idea as the alt writers who say, look at this wonderful culture and everybody in it is white, so white people must be better, which is absurd. I mean, I, I always call it goofy level thinking, like goofy from the Walt Disney movies. You know, oh, look, look, Mikey, they're all white, so that must be why they have such a good culture. But it's really not fair to Goofy. I mean, Goofy was a perfectly reasonable fellow. He just, you know, he wasn't all that bright, but he was bright enough not to make it that simple. Nobody knows why cultures rise, but the one thing we do know is we do know that cultures surprise you. I mean, I've often said in Britain, the Irish were the low culture. They would say, oh, the Irish, you know, they're, they were basically uh, talked about the way people in the South used to talk about blacks in the 50s. That's the way they talked about the Irish. The Irish come to America and they thrive. The Jews of Russia were the criminal class. They came to America and once they were set free and once they were treated well, they thrived. And more than that, in, in ancient Rome, the people that they feared were the German tribes who settled Europe. So the people that they thought were the barbarians became the founders of this great, great culture. And here's what I mean when I say it's a great culture. When I, when I was in Kenya, when I was visiting Kenya, my wife and I said to our tour guide, uh, you know, we keep going and seeing these tourist things, but we'd like to see how real people lived. And he was thrilled. He said, people never asked to see how the real people lived. And he took us to a village that was as poor as any place I've ever seen. People were lit literally living in grass huts. Uh, they were starving. There was a drought out on. They were uh, ble taking blood from their cattle, from their uh, goats to drink the blood so that they wouldn't uh, die of thirst. Uh, and, you know, I would look at, I looked at these people and look, 
on the last day, they're going to be standing beside the throne of God, just like me, right? And they may be at the front of the line because they didn't have a lot of the advantages that I had. There's no moral uh, superiority between me and them. There's certainly no moral superiority between them and Isaac Newton. But if you want to say who contributed more, which is what culture is, who contributed more to the advance of humankind, Isaac Newton did. Thomas Jefferson did. Michelangelo, Shakespeare, and Mozart did. There's simply no question about it. And in order to not say that, you basically have to get rid of all values. And that's what the left has been trying to do. And I don't know, I, I'm not trying to psycholo psychologize them. I don't know why they do it. But by getting rid of all the values, uh, you, you basically go insane. You're talking insane, insanity. You cannot say that a totem and the Sistine Chapel are on the same level of art. And I doubt the guy who made the totem thinks that his totem is on the same level of the Sistine Chapel. This is not a question of morality. It's not a question of, of moral worth. And it's certainly not a question of race. We simply don't know why cultures at certain times rise and others fall. But all we do know is it passes from culture to culture, it passes from race to race, and it will continue continue to do so, and we'll see other cultures rise hopefully higher than the culture of Europe. But right now, this is the great culture. And we have to be brave enough to face the charges of racism to talk about this honestly, but we also have to be smart enough not to become racist ourselves while we talk about the truth. Shakespeare isn't Shakespeare because he's white. There's a million, million things that go into making a Shakespeare, one of them being the providence of God. We do not know where he comes from. We can only celebrate the fact that he's there and be honest about the fact that this is one of the pinnacles of human creation. You know, they've destroyed Saul Bellow, one of America's great novelists, because he said, I'll believe in the culture of the Zulus when you tell me, show me the Zulu who wrote War and Peace. And they simply have written Saul Bellow out of our uh, canon when he is one of the two or three greatest novelists America ever produced. But he was he was just talking the truth. He wasn't making a moral judgment on the Zulu people. He was simply talking about the products, the cultural products that a society throws up. I got to stop. Mailbag tomorrow. Be there. And, and you will yeah. sound, you will, that's how happy you will sound after I answer your questions. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Austin Stevens and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. And our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saevitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. And our production assistant is Nick Sheehan. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. On The Matt Wall Show, we're not just discussing politics. We're talking culture, faith, family, all of the things that are really important to you. So come join the conversation.